hello everyone, I'm Kylan Rumbold, project lead for SCP Containment Breach Reborn, and this is your update for version 0.0.3, which I will now just refer to as the lighting update or lighting overhaul to save us all time, even though lighting is only a small part of this update. Later on I'll be joined by a few members of the team that'll be discussing their respective roles as a part of CBR. Everything will be bookmarked, and for the sake of online privacy, some team members have decided to speak under an alias or their usernames. However, before we do that, I'm going to run through some common questions and comments that have been kindly gathered up for me to answer. The first question here is why you call SCP Containment Breach on Steam, and are you allowed to do that? Quite early on when starting the project, we sought out permission from Regalis himself, who said that he was alright with it, even though due to the nature of the SCP license we probably would have been fine to do it regardless. That being said, we're still going to refer to the game and list it under the Reborn title everywhere else where we can. Next up is how much will the game cost? The game will be both free and open source, and we plan on adding workshop support down the line with the repository public on GitHub. What engine are you using? Good 4 written in GD scripts. How many people are in the team? The active team is currently the largest it's been, with 12 people, 8 of which are volunteers and 5 working on the game directly, although we're hoping to move away from volunteer work over time. Question 5 here is why did X design change? For the most part we just want creative freedom to make something more enjoyable and original, even though we're working off the foundation of the classic game. That being said, a lot of SCPs are planned to have classic style models such as 173 and 049 we've already shown off, however there are certain ones we've planned such as 939 that wouldn't work with the classic model due to the huge gameplay changes, or 096 where such a model swap really isn't necessary. The final question is why isn't more progress being made? Well, we're currently working about as much as we can but I'll go into it a little bit more later. Finances are our main bottleneck, and we want this to be viable, but we will need the support on Patreon to make that happen and make developing games a legitimate opportunity for most of us. Things have been looking up, and we only hope to keep that momentum as we work more on the game. There's a link to our Patreon down below. I'll now go through the list of changes made in this update. To keep things shrimp, I'll break them up into four segments. The first of these categories are the visuals, as they'll be the first thing you notice when stepping into this update. The biggest change is so that we now have directed lighting and multiple fog types, adding more depth to the game. With our random child picker system, the game will choose from a variety of lighting setups on runtime, with minimal impact on loading times. These should make everything seem a lot less flat and really fill out the empty space. To complement this, we also now have dust. Dust floats around, catching the light in brighter spaces, but is heavily optimized and designed to be as unobtrusive as we can whilst maintaining some level of accuracy. The torch has a dedicated cookie, so no more fangirling emoji unfortunately, and all sorts of materials from the concrete to glass to metals have had fairly significant tweaks. For those of you that were worried about the flickering lights we have around the facility, there's also now an epilepsy safety toggle to disable harsh effects like that. And that's about all in terms of direct changes to the atmosphere. For more physical changes to the world around you, we've redesigned the keycards to have a more sleek design befitting of the foundation. We've replaced all of the pipe models. The hallways have had even more refinement. That seems to be becoming a running trend with these updates. And we've refined the menu shader a little more. Finally, I'd like to give honorable mentions to all of the improvements to material and shader compilation to reduce the stuttering and low FPS people have been experiencing when starting up the game, the optimizations to the materials themselves and overall game size, and also to the addition of global illumination, which should soften a lot of the harsher shadows that were found in earlier builds of 0.0.3. However, if you're interested in what it's like to work on the writing and lore for CBR, here's Arthur. Hello everybody, my name is Arthur Faraday, but if you've been active in our community or a few other SCP-related communities, you probably know me as Wood or Wood Mr. 13. I am proud to say that I am now a game designer and one of the head writers for SCP Containment Breach Reborn. Uh, writing's been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember, especially when it comes to horror, and the SCP Foundation mythos are one of the biggest reasons for that. I've been a member of the SCP community for well over a decade now, and it is an honor to be a part of a project like this. I genuinely can't wait to share what we've been working on with you guys. Uh, unfortunately, the nature of my work is embedded with secrets and spoilers, so 
I can't share a lot of those details, but what I can tell you is that ultimately my goal with this project is to stay true to the story of the original game, while also expanding on it in various ways and improving how it's presented to the player. Uh, the original containment breach is very near and dear to me, and I'm sure anyone who's listening to this appreciates that game just as much as I do, so rest assured I'll be doing my absolute best to create an experience that lives up to the original and hopefully even surpasses it. To me, one of the most important things to keep in mind when attempting to do just that is replicating the tone of the original game and its narrative. A uh, good example of this is I've always appreciated how willing Containment Breach was to completely disregard its own terrifying atmosphere. Uh, what I mean by that is how for every horrifying first encounter with the voices in the basement or relentless pursuit by the Shy Guy, there was a goofy interaction with Agent Ulgren and his squad mate or the discovery of the classic Radical Airy memo that has been just memed into oblivion. That's part of what made the original game so memorable and it's something I want to keep around for our take on it. Those instances help present a more lighthearted human element to keep players enthralled and were representative of what the Foundation is meant to be, a light in the darkness. That being said, don't go into this expecting it to be all fun and games. At its core, this is a horror game and I fully intend to go all in with the fear factor. All in all, I'm thrilled to be a part of this project, and I'm very excited to show you all what we're capable of. Thank you for having faith in us, and I hope you're looking forward to the future of Containment Breach Reborn just as much as we are. For the environment, the list of changes are fairly short. We've begun to add more clutter. Primarily in the intro area, you'll see that larger objects such as servers, desks, and bins are now in. We also have a basic item spawning system which is extremely underutilized at the moment, and small objects and items can be knocked and thrown around. For the hallways, we've switched the models again, they're really becoming the localization files of this game, reduced the strength of weighted normals, and reworked the randomly generated pipe clusters along with the models being redone and expanded on. Uh, hi, my name is Wesley. I go by Minty Meta on Discord, and I am the lead 3D modeler for SCP Containment Reach Remake. So I have pretty much modeled everything that's in the game right now, besides the characters, because that's Jake's role. He's the character artist. I do a lot of base textures, and then Metroid takes it and makes it look all pretty. Yeah, so when I say everything, I mean literally hallways, doors, buttons, clutter, props, all sorts of shenanigans, intro area, all the redoing old ones, making new ones. When you're making a remake, it's a fine line of balancing, making something that looks similar to the old piece, but also better looking because it's obviously newer hardware and we can do that. And it's probably a bit more functional without losing too much of the old look, which is a bit difficult sometimes because I have to make things up when looking at the older models because they're very basic and don't really have a lot to go on. So there's a lot of creativity involved with coming up with new looks for different models and I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm trying to speedrun and think about how to say things. Pretty simply put, since I started working on the project, I've got a lot better at making things. I have learned how game engines handle models and how to best export them to be used in games, uh, how to optimize, things like that. I've learned of all the funny things that happen where not centering things and unwrapping correctly in certain areas and weighted normals, all the cool fun stuff. So it's been a big learning experience and pretty much all my new models are much, I don't know, that's not important. What it's like to work with others. I really enjoy working with everyone on the team. I think. We all get along really well, but the person I work closest with would have to be Metroid, just because he's the texture artist and pretty much everything I do goes to him and then it looks fucking sick after it comes out because it just, he does such a good job. I have to make sure the, the UVs unwrap nicely, everything's packed in a good way so that we get as much sweet textile density out of every single model that we can. But otherwise, I am pretty aware of the texturing workflow, so I go through the process of making everything easy for him to work with as I'm going along, because I do the base textures sometimes, and then just hand everything over to him, and then he makes it look better. So yeah, I think uh, pretty easy to work with him. We get along really well. Things are going pretty smoothly. Yippee. Future goals. Um, I 
do really enjoy hard surface modeling. I want to get better at that. Kind of doing it a little bit now, getting better at it slowly, but it's something I want to focus on more in the future. In terms of software that I want to use, I would love to try plasticity for hard surface modeling at some point, because it seems really, really cool. Um, and also maybe Houdini, but I think that's more of like a, like a VFX thing. It's not really, it doesn't really go much into modeling, but it's just cool to know how to use it. Plasticity is a CAD modeling software as opposed to poly modeling like Blender or Maya. So CAD modeling is entirely math and it can just do curved surfaces really, really well because it's just it's just math and you don't need to worry about things under overlapping in weird ways. It's just like vector graphics, but for 3D modeling. Um, it's really cool, but yeah, it's useful for like product design and things, but it's real nice for making game assets. The only problem with that is you then need to retopologize and make it ready for a game because it's not made straight out the gate for a game. <laughs> Go support us on Patreon. We need money. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not begging for money, but if you want to give me money, that'd be really cool. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so that's pretty much everything I do. Um, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Cut. No. For the lighting update, the bulk of the work went into the back end. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep these fairly short and only elaborate on the ones we believe would be more interesting for you. In no particular order, there's a ton of memory optimizations, a physically based camera for the player, 173 state transitions, more granular graphical settings, improved shader compilers to reduce early stutters, better texture handling and formatting, which should reduce the size of the game and make everything load faster again, general material optimizations, an improved glass shader to reduce the artifacting you might have noticed in 0.0.2, .0 increased the culling aggression of most things in a game, so hopefully your computer won't have to do as much all at once. We refactored the stepping algorithms to make things smoother and less likely to break in unexpected areas, an epilepsy friendly mode, a wind shader, PVS bound for better room culling, and a material compiler to force compilation on game start. Scott will be going into more detail later. As for changes to the player, they're much more focused around quality of life. There's view bobbing for the camera and sway on all equipped items to make them feel more present in the world. A more dynamic blinking system which will be expanded on more down the line, and some modified values for both blinking and stamina. And that's about it as far as all the big stuff goes. Because this is a video I want to keep reasonably short, there's not a huge amount of detail here, but hopefully it gives you a solid idea of what we're aiming towards, and none of it would have been possible without the support of our wonderful patrons. I'll flash up some of the miscellaneous additions and changes I may have missed on the screen now, and then we can continue to meet the team. Unfortunately, we were unable to include some things, such as the finalized 173 AI, and a couple of other overhauls due to personal time restraints, but that just means you'll have even more to look forward to in the next update. And now, Scott will be covering some of the things I glossed over before. Hello, I'm Scott, the lead developer for Containment Breach Reborn, and I'm here to talk about the technical changes and additions in this update. For the physics related changes, the player has had minor fixes applied to the stepping algorithm. The player can now climb stairs correctly and stop getting stuck sliding along door frames. The player can now kick around some physics objects as well. Rigid bodies now get disabled when over 15 meters away from the player. This significantly reduces the amount of physics objects active in the world. Holdable items can now be thrown by the player. These can knock over objects or press buttons. When it comes to generation, we've started working on the clutter systems. This update includes the initial generation of desks, drawers, some posters and bins. We've also added a little under development sign, which we use to signify unfinished content. Hallway pipes will now spawn in random layouts throughout the facility. We've also overhauled how the hallways are lit by including some floodlights, and we've also tied in a procedural light color system as well. There will be more lighting setups implemented down the line, but we're happy with them for now. Speaking of the next update, while none of these are truly set in stone, I'd like to bring up our current goals for the next update, 0.0.4. We're hoping to at the very least get in one new SCP, ideally something original to CBR, meaning not previously included in Containment Breach or its respective mods. On top of that, we're looking to massively expand on the amount of sounds in the game. So that means brand new ambience, lines for D9341, and audio for 173, as well as controller support and a surprise update that won't be announced until it happens so you have another surprise to wait for. 
The stretch goals include things such as finalizing 173's AI for early access, and also expanding on how much you can interact with the world around you. As always, there'll be a link to our Trello down below for anyone looking for real-time updates on what we're doing. If you're curious about the audio work and other things that'll be going into 0.0.4 .0 and updates beyond, Denesov has you covered. Hi, my name is Daniel, but you might know me as DSOF. Aside from trolling in general chat, I'm mostly responsible for the game's audio and some systems, uh, such as inventory. Let me share some progress for the game's audio, uh, everything I did so far, and shed some light on my future work. For 0.0.3, I set a goal to get a draft version of Ambience Cues for Light Containment Zone. They're by no means final as with everything I do, it will go through many iterations and tweaks based on feedback. Let me know what you think. Inventory is a central part of Containment Breach and is one of the gameplay pillars that will see a major reimagining for Reborn. The goal is to keep it simple while introducing several quality of life changes, such as quick slots, that allow players to bind items to number keys on the keyboard. This is also a system that saw me experimenting with audio as well, expanding different pickup sounds from Containment Breach by introducing a neat little detail in the form of unique item slot sounds whenever you move the items around in the interface. The system is also designed in a way to allow a wide variety of item types too. Original Containment Breach had you use consumables like medkits, SCP-500 and so on, where armor, gas mask and the jade ring, as well as stored documents and keycards in walls and clipboards. All of this is coming to CBR, with the added possibility to create new item types effortlessly. This is especially important for modding support, for those who have the wireless ideas for additions. As mentioned previously, I'm always looking forward to polishing and refining my existing work in addition to new audio, but I'd also like to share what the further work for the inventory will look like. One last piece of the inventory puzzle is a system that I call Item Database, this is a technical system and it does not refer to the lore codex in-game, although it will make it easier to implement one. It's in the name, a central system for keeping track of all items available in the game. Current items are stored in individual files called resources. This is where you set values such as item name, description and other data per item type. The problem is that further down the line you'd want to have these items get spawned in the game world, so you have two options either provide and reference paths to the item files for each pickup object, or use a single, easy-to-remember identifier. The solution becomes more obvious as soon as you factor features such as mod support. You need to somehow access mod items in a convenient way as well. The inventory interface rewrite is also something I'm looking forward to tackling. The current code is hacky, hence suffering from countless bugs. Aside from piecing the entire puzzle, it's also really important to make sure it doesn't fall apart as soon as you're about to demonstrate the final result. One of the tasks I was assigned was various clothing sounds for whenever the player moves about. For this one, I'll be creating audio as well as implementing it in-game. SCP-173 Sound Cues Another important aspect of 173, aside from AI and visuals, is making sure it's also terrifying in regards to audio. Currently, it has audio for moving and killing the player, but lacks ambience, stingers, and anything alike. This will be another point of focus for me. That's all I had to share in regards to my work. I'm very excited to see my audio work come to life, and I hope you like the final results. Now, to round off the video, you may have noticed that we were asking around on various platforms for questions, and I wanted to say thank you for the comments and the surprisingly high number of DMs. I'll flag on screen who in the team answered these questions and what their role is. Will the player talk? D9341 will continue to be a mostly silent character in CBR. There'll be times where he may utter some words or exclaim, but he won't be outright talking. Will there be more lore? Yes. How much did you have to change or fix when you switched engines? For the viewers without context, we've changed from Godot to Godot C Sharp to Unreal and then back to Godot again. We started out with very few game assets as we're not using the Blitz 3D containment breach models. So when we made the first move, we were only set back asset wise a tiny bit, as transferring models and materials within Godot is fairly quick and simple. If we'd persisted with the C Sharp build, we'd need to rewrite all of the script in C Sharp of which we only transcoded a few. The most we got in the C-sharp build was the first version of the menu, 
and moving from Godot's C Sharp to Unreal was probably the biggest change. Moving the models and materials from the Godot versions was more complicated than moving between Godot, but nothing that was overly difficult. Development didn't get particularly far compared to the first Godot build, but it did create a handful of systems that we brought back to GDScript. The final move back to Godot was to take the C Sharp build's menu screen, but none of the scripts from Unreal or the C Sharp build were usable. And the GD script from the old build was not brought back as we felt we could write better code now. But, while the code itself wasn't usable, Radin was able to rewrite the player side of the interactable system and the objective system. How did you get the sounds? My sources depend on control and availability. A good example is UI sounds. These are synthesized digitally or recorded by myself, for instance, inventory sounds. In other cases, it's 50% my recordings of mundane household items like me scratching a metal ladder with a fork or opening and closing drawers. The rest are sourced online. I never use the sourced audio by itself though, and it's always a mix of samples and props that I can't record myself, because a typical household only has so much stuff to play around with, and I don't have the equipment for good quality field recording. What's it like trying to optimize the game? It's not easy, and it's a very broad topic. We optimize physics by pausing rigid bodies far away from the player and avoid intensive algorithms like stepping on non-player characters. We make sure that any CPU intensive actions, like checking over every rigid body node, is done in two second intervals instead of per frame, and we throw some of the nodes like the procedural generation culling handler onto threads to help spread the processing load. We also make sure that we have the lowest possible number of nodes visible at once, hiding everything the player won't be close enough to see, or in the case of hallways, isn't aligned to them. When it comes to optimizing shaders, I've written a handful of shaders with varying quality settings, so that expensive calculations can be disabled by the user for better performance on lower end hardware. Stuff like artificial depth by parallax mapping looks really cool, but it's also fairly expensive compared to a shader without it, so we have an option that disables it. On the topic of parallax mapping and custom shaders, we use custom shaders with different parallax mapping implementation than Godot's built-in materials, so we get better quality artificial depth for better performance, with some self-shadowing sprinkled on top. One of the major optimization issues we have right now is that Godot doesn't have texture streaming support, which really raises the hardware bar up to GPUs with enough VRAM because we need to load all of the textures before we can downscale them. It's a really scuffed solution, but it's all we have until texture streaming is implemented officially. Is this the same as Containment Breach? To a certain extent, our game is heavily inspired by the original Containment Breach, and that includes the story aspects of it. My ideal scenario is keeping the important stuff true to the original whilst also expanding on the narrative to create lore of our own. How quickly are features being implemented? That's a hard one to answer. Almost all of us are volunteers, so we can't dedicate our full time to anything yet because otherwise we wouldn't be able to afford to do what we can. You can speed up development by supporting us on Patreon. For real though, it varies. Implementing the dust took about a day, but most of it was figuring out how to make it render efficiently. Implementing the posters has taken weeks, because first we need to brainstorm ideas for them, Farrah will come back in a few hours with a poster, and then it'll be a few days of group discussion and back and forthing until we're all happy with it. And then the process starts again for the next poster. Once we've got a handful of posters, they all get combined into an atlas designed to work with a custom shader that makes the posters render efficiently, and also move like they're swaying in a light breeze. It's a really minor feature in the grand scheme of things, but a lot of time and work goes into it. Stuff like the lighting rework has been in development since 0.0.2 drops, and it was only finished a week before this video was released. We have a lot of stuff being worked on at any time, like we've had SCP redacted being modelled and textured for the first time, even though it won't feature in this update. I suppose the best answer to this question is that we're implementing them as quickly as we can? How close are we to seeing the implementation of new SCPs? Sooner than you'd expect, later than we want. This will hopefully become less of an issue over time with our Patreon. How did you design the people? For Class D personnel, my goal was to stay true to the original design whilst adding my own twist to it. For example, the long sleeve white shirt below the orange prison suit. The same logic was applied to security personnel who kept a similar silhouette and overall description, but with a noticeable change being the distinctions by tiers that would change their equipment and colour scheme according to their respective duties. As for Foundation personnel, their designs were completely original with the intent of making them look way more visually appealing than the original game 
that depicted researchers wearing nothing but a buttoned shirt with a tie. With that future mindset, the mobile task force teams were given the approach of straying from the usual interpretations of futuristic tactical shooters. Instead, the NTF and SNE were given an aesthetic fitting to their name, ensuring that they had the necessary equipment for their task. The Chaos Insurgency can be described as zombies by design. My interpretation while designing them is that their soldiers lack any self-identity but being loyal to their purpose. Their equipment is seemingly lower budget compared to the Foundation's soldiers, and they all have tattoos on their forearms that represent the insurgency's beliefs and origins. Will the game have gamepad support in early versions? We hope to have support for controllers and gamepads in the next update, so yeah. Even if we don't get them in 0.0.4, they'll still be pretty high priority. How do you get things from lore into the game? It depends on the lore. If we're talking about surface level details like security clearance or the way certain monsters behave, it's pretty simple to implement. Story details like the origins of the breach or D9341's past start with lots of writing and revising, and eventually we get to a point where we're confident in its quality. How we implement it into the game at that point is just a matter of imagination on our part. Some pieces of narrative might be found in classified documents, some might be revealed naturally through game progression, and some might require you to go out of your way to find them. The goal is to make unraveling the mysteries engaging and not reliant on obscure details that most people would never even notice. Why doesn't the game look the same with the lights and stuff? The technical details for indirect lighting in this project are almost entirely different than the original containment breach, mostly due to much more challenging design requirements. The original containment breach relies entirely on baked light maps for indirect lighting, which, while tried and true, just aren't usable for the amount of randomness in props. This is where the answer would be pre-computed light probes and probe volumes such as Unity's APV or UE's volumetric light mapping. That due to the lights themselves being randomized, techniques like this aren't usable either. Not to worry though, techniques such as diffuse environment probes or real-time course irradiance volume caching would be here to save the day. However, these are decently niche and very rarely used by consumer engines, including Godot, which supports neither of them. With all these strategies crossed off the list, the only options left without heavily modifying the renderer are artist-placed indirect lighting using helper lights or highly systemic real-time techniques. Even with both of these being used, a different lighting style is being used to cater them a fair bit by being far higher contrast and much more directional. This is so direct lighting can be the main focus and indirect lighting can take a general backseat, since artist place helper lights can often be crude and inaccurate. And most systemic techniques, even those that don't rely on ray marching or ray tracing, are often decently expensive in terms of performance, so there's no guarantee that players will actually be able to use them with acceptable performance. Is Ogryn AI? No, we got back the original voice actor a little over 11 years later. Why do the same things change so much? There have been a lot of textures. There have in fact been a lot of textures and materials. The reason why they change, get updated or revised so frequently is mostly just notes, feedback, adjustments and iteration. There's a lot of materials in modern rendering, since colour is far from the only factor controlled by artists. Each physical property of a material is represented by an image texture of some sort, with many variables, sometimes very specific things that need adjusting and tweaking. Whether it's a situation of, hey, this trash can is too glossy for my eyes, can it get a polish pass? Something more technical, such as a classic, I want to do a rebake so I can get slightly better ambient occlusion coverage around this area, it'd look really good. Or maybe a pretty quick and dirty material just needs rethinking and redoing with some more well thought out ideas. So I put my creativity hat on and do the position I'm actually credited for on this project every once in a while. For legal reasons, this is a joke. Another factor that's important to consider is that our assets specifically go through a lot of testing and validating, often getting put into other renderers and engines for quality checking before hitting the project in order to make sure they're looking as we expect them to. And while the style consistency isn't perfect, we're still on early access, it helps a lot in making each asset look good on its own as we think it needs to. And finally, we weren't sure if we should include this one, but specifically from user YesMan of SCP Fallen Foundation mod for Minecraft. They ask, is it possible for the game to connect to your plug so it vibrates when you die? This sparks an embarrassingly long discussion within the team. But long story short, yes. However, 
it would be quite a huge waste to limit it to depths, so we brainstormed other ways to integrate it to make gameplay more tactile in a hypothetical scenario. If we reach a stage where modding is supported, it'll likely be released as an official mod, although I'd rather divert those resources to greater accessibility support for now, along with some other more fun and widely applicable stuff. If you want to embarrass yourself the way Yesman has, or just to follow the updates to CBR, you can join our Discord server, Twitter, or Patreon, all three links below. I hope this video was helpful with giving you a little more insight into our processes and what to expect from the latest update and in the future. I'll see you when I see you. Hello everyone, and it's me again. Uh, I wanted to make an appearance, but I had a ton of other stuff come up. I wanted to do a, an in-person thing, we wanted to get more team members involved, but so much stuff happened. So. At least we got it out. Uh, the next update I think is going to be pretty cool. I'm hoping we can all get it done on time. We're going to get there. Thank you for all of your support. You can see the patrons' names going past now. Feel free to support if you want to support our future. And thanks for watching. I'll see you, hopefully, with Alpha 4. We're changing the naming convention. Thanks.